Hello and welcome to Genius Tea Time. Thank you so much, Deb, for coming and joining us. This is awesome. I'm really I'm glad. So happy to be. Yay. Um, Deb Savini, in her own words, is a multidisciplinary artist, um, has been based in Washington, D.C., soon to be based in Ithaca, right? Um, as a Nice. As a uh, costume and scenic designer, she specializes in new work and devised pieces, bringing a sense of play and iterative experimentation to her designs. Her love of dramaturgy, research, and cross-cultural dialogue has led her into academia, where she explores the development of design-driven works inspired by literature, politics, personal aesthetic, and experience. She also works as a textile artist and painter slash printmaker. And she is the writer creator of Hello, My Name Is, which is an immersive installation about Korean adoptees, which was produced by the Welders in 2017. And the subsequent design work was exhibited at the 2019 Prague Quadrennial. How cool is that? How was that? How was Prague? Oh, oh mind blowing. <laughs> like, I have heard amazing. such great stuff. What, what was felt really life changing about it? Um, I think just like being in a place. I mean, like, so the Prague Quadrennial is like the Olympics of theater design. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's amazing. You're with, you're with these like geniuses from from all over the world, and like, it, it's just to be to be among that many creators and to be like taking workshops and seeing the work internationally, like what's what's going on. It just, in some ways. I've always felt like a little bit of a theater weirdo, you know, that like I, I do these things and I have these thoughts and I have these philosophies about like how I want to be doing theater and how I make work. And I'm like, does anyone else think about these things? And obviously I found many U.S. makers, you know, that I can have these conversations with, but it tends to not be the norm, you know, to sort of ask the big, big meaty question, you know, the people are like, well, we can't address that in four weeks. I'm like, well, yes, I know. Um, oh, but no one I think can, to... but we can start. Yeah, right, we can try. <laughs> you can try. Mm -hmm. And so to be in Prague and just be in this space where like no one was there to produce anything. We were just there to like think and see shows and, and see street performance and admire each other's work. Just oh, was like awesome like that that's like a, a little design utopia um also in europe like super cool i had never been there before so it's also oh. just a beautiful city i haven't been either i've heard just gorgeous things did you find some people who are like really these are the ones i want to work with for forever or be inspired by or um i mean definitely i have many people from there that i'm like following you know on instagram and facebook and it, it's um just seeing a lot of it's even hard to say you know like just just knowing that those people are out there and that I can that I'm still in a place where I can be like what do you think about blah 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 or like there there's this um there's a woman in Norway Annika who is like do we can't even explain it she's a costume designer sort of she does a lot of like installation work that involves microbes um, and she's literally Ooh. like taking microbes and, and applying them to fabric. And that is like distressing the fabric because the microbes like eat away at the thing, you know, and then she's like oh. taking it, stripping it, and then like making that into costume. Like it's mind blowing. I was like, that that is the the conjunction of science and art in in a way that like I just never thought possible. Um amazing like that <laughs> you know, go to the quadrennial and i'm like oh my god and really i guess she's she's making a lot of like wearable art mm -hmm. um but you know she worked on this uh, 3d immersive like sound and nature installation based on trees because I, I took a uh. workshop you know and, like all these people are from like the uk and poland and um and yeah we just got to like make a work in three days that involved mud and trees you know in vr <laughs> and it was like that's kind awesome. of insane and it again but like how cool yeah um what what is the yeah. artist's name do you remember oh my gosh uh anika flow a-n-n-i-k-e-f-l-o at least that's what it is on facebook okay she has a much 
her, like her actual name is is something much much longer but i i can find it and put it in the chat later no problem at all you know because yes i found that with some other people i finish names can be enormous very long <laughs> yes. very long uh, what got you into doing theater design in the first place oh by accident you know I'll yeah yeah time. so many of us yeah i i've been sewing since i was nine mm -hmm. um you know my mom and all sorts of sort of unfinished projects you know and i was like mom what is this and she was like oh sewing machine nah you know i used to sew but whatever you know it was one of those like old 70s singers that just sat in the the permanent table and so i was like well i mean i kind of want to learn how to use it you know and it was loud and rude and hard to learn and uh but and she had sort of taught me to hand sew, but with machine sewing, she's like, well, it's hard. You don't want to do it. And every time I hear it's hard, you don't want to do it. Then I like, I'm like, yes, I but I do that. think I do. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to do that. And of course, you know, it was a struggle and the first projects were a mess, you know, but like, I really, I, I kind of loved it because it was like, yeah, I was working with patterns. So I was taking something flat. Oh yeah, you found her. Um, yeah, I was taking something flat and then turning it into sculpture, and I was like, "Oh my god, that's a thing!" You know, and so like just magic as yeah. as a child, um, and I was an only child, so I really had, you know, like especially in summers, like a lot of time on my hands. So I would either be like outside swinging on swings and running around the fields because I grew up on a lot of acreage in the middle of the woods, um, or I would be like inside cutting patterns out on the floor you know, and trying to figure something out with, with no instruction. Mom was like, yep, go, go for it. And I was like, all right. Have a great time. Bye. <laughs> are, you, are you, are you being good? Okay, great. You know, um, so I think from there, like, yeah, sewing as a child. And I realized too, that I'd also been like, my dad was an engineer. So I was always crafting scale models or I'd be like, dad, I want to make a replica of a ship, you know? And he'd be like, oh, well, you're going to do it in scale. Well, what scale? You know, so I, I, I don't know. Funny, my whole time <laughs> pushes towards, you know, what I'm doing now, like so naturally in a lot of ways that I didn't even realize at the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, I got to college, you know, fast forward and I needed a work study job. And I saw that the costume shop was hiring. This is back in the days where you went to the student center and there were like index cards on the wall. So, the, you know, the mid 90s. And so I took the index card down, you know, and I called them. And uh, I was like, hi, I saw the, you know, the job ad and she's like, great, you know, come on down. I don't even think I needed to bring a resume. Like it just wasn't even a thing, you know, she's like, come on down, we'll talk. And so I brought some pictures of some things I had made. Um, I had, I wore like a flannel shirt that I had made like the previous year, cause also the nineties. So of course I was making a flannel shirt. Um, and I kind of, I went down there and she's like, well, what can you do? And I'm like, oh, I made this shirt and here's a picture of my cousin's prom dress. And uh, she was like, you're hired. And uh, so yeah. we need sewers. <laughs> exactly. Well, I didn't understand that until years later when I was a costume shop manager. And then whenever I got a student who knew, who had skills going in that I like didn't have to teach from the ground up, I was like, oh, you're hired. Um, Cause it's a really specific skill set. It really is. So what I mean, was know. there like a show that you remember going to or at all that just said, okay, this this might be a thing I could do regularly? I mean, the yeah. costume shop is a great way to start, but did you mm -hmm. see theater? I did. I mean, I went to college uh, in in rural Vermont. I went to Middlebury okay. College, which has a small but mighty program. Um, they're actually like pretty amazing. You know, I think when I was there, there might have been like 40 majors total. And mm -hmm. we everything. We worked sun up to sundown. And like it just, yeah, it was it was kind of an amazing, an amazing time of creation. We just lived in the theater building. I mean, as all theater majors do. As we do. Um, <laughs> as we continue to do. It's good training for life. Yes. But um yeah, I I just like you know, so I guess I saw a lot of the work of of the people that, you know, were around me, other majors, but there are a couple shows, even after I had been like designing things that sort of solidified my like, I must do this for my life. Because mm -hmm. I sort of, you know, 
consumer to theater. I didn't really start doing theater until I got to college. Up until then, I had done a lot of music, um, mm. but not, you know, my friend was the theater person. That was like her realm and my realm was music. And so getting into uh, into theater in college was always sort of through tech because up until then, I'd only played in like orchestra pits. So uh, yeah. I what saw- did you play? Oops. Clarinet. Oh, all the clarinets. Uh, but I saw this production. I mean, who knows? In retrospect, it might have been brilliant, might have been terrible. I don't know. But I saw a production of Hamlet Machine, Heiner Mueller's Hamlet Machine, which Neat. is like such a um totally abstract, totally yep. strange, and super like. I don't know. It was directed again, like, why do I keep coming back to Norway? But it was directed by a Norwegian student, um, Henning Hagland, who I think is still making theater. Uh Um, And he was like, you know, it was the 90s, but he was like one of the the very few like openly gay people on campus. It seemed like, you know, because people just weren't out yet. But here was this like strange European guy who made like really cool theater and he was also a designer and I was like oh wow like Henning's brilliant and um I saw that show and I remember like it just kind of blew my mind because it was this bare bones production you know like when he's going and he's, he's Hamlet has this moment where he's sort of like killing everyone in the you know, everyone around him symbolically and they had had this sword and they took a whole bunch of like styrofoam heads and he's like chopping at these styrofoam heads, but we're like five feet away, you know? And it's just this like crazy chunks of styrofoam flying everywhere. Um, And I remember like just feeling like, I I don't know, kind of tongue tied. I think a lot of it had to do with the sound design, the sort of immersive water of Ophelia drowning. And I was like, this is, this is remarkable. And I left the show. I'd seen it by myself. And as I was walking, it was like raining. I remember like trying to walk across campus and I just started sobbing. Like, I don't know, whatever my body. I was so kind of like rocked by that experience. Um, that yeah like I still I still remember you know like just getting chills like sitting in that room experiencing that whole piece wow and that's like it is like I'm not even I don't even think I've ever told Henning that you know but like it it, uh, it is one of those pieces that really just sticks with me in the moments of like I gotta do this like there's more yeah. to this thing that is just like making costumes and like meeting people like that's nice but I think there was just something truly like deep um, in my soul that needed to see that moment at that time and then realize that theater could affect people that strongly. And then I was like, this is this, I got to do it. You know, yeah. I don't know how, I don't know. What, you know, and I was like a, a, a sophomore, junior in college, like so young thinking about that now and just being so like flabbergasted by this show. Um, Cause it's funny. I was not wowed by like seeing things on Broadway. And I actually, even to date, have seen very few things on Broadway. I find it to be cost prohibitive. And like, I'm not a huge fan of musicals, despite the fact that all I seem to be designing now are musicals. Um, <laughs> it's like music, <laughs> you know, but okay. they pay, they're good. Yeah. I'm having a good time. But I I would rather create them than see them, I think. That's fair. And, you know, so... It's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's been an interesting, interesting mix. So like, while I love big splashy entertainment things, I'd almost rather see bare bones, experimental, take your heart and tear it out of your body kind of theater. Um, yeah. Cause that's why I got, it. that's, that's my soul right there. Well, and you've made some of that yourself multiple times. I've yeah, I've tried. Are there some pieces, I mean, I know that um, the piece that you created yourself is, of course, really very important to you. Um, but that sounds like that was, I, I love the descriptive of that, that somebody said, you know, the obsessively immersive world that you created. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. What was it like creating your own? Um, Really empowering. I mean, so yeah. I guess I'll... Set it up. The the great thing about the welders, which is a um, 
sort of like an iterative theater company. It was founded by six playwrights. I'm trying to remember five playwrights yep. and executive director. A bunch of playwrights got together and they were all um, brilliant, mid-career, well, like pretty well established, um, what I would say, traditional playwrights. People who write plays okay. that hand them off to companies produce but a lot a lot of them had self-produced they were all movers and shakers in the playwriting scene then at the end of their term kind of like a 13p or other you know new york companies uh club thumb who've, who've done this kind of work they pass on the entire company to a new group of artists so the cohort of artists that okay. i was a part of a bunch of like really different you know there were divisors it was a designer there were people who were community organizers and a couple playwrights you know we did dramaturg so we had like a really interesting cohort yeah and as a group we made a really interesting case for like other people can make plays and that's yeah. what our cohort um Neat. and so i when I signed on that I would have to quote write a play and I was like oh, I don't know what that's gonna be but I had to propose something yeah when we applied it's like I'm gonna I'm gonna write a play about adoptees I don't know exactly what it is but I think I drew like this like family tree airplane thing and I was like I'm gonna make a show it's gonna be <laughs> something <Don't worry. laughs> and then proceeded to sort of talk about it for two years <laughs> um so yeah I, I mean I will say in that process like in 2015 it all started with the trip of of going back to Korea for the first time in 2015 oh, wow. um, so I mean more like mid 30s you know 30, 36 maybe I'm trying to think yeah I'll do the math someday but like it um I had been, never been back yeah because you were adopted when you were what maybe five months you Got know, it. so I remember nothing nothing yeah. of the old country so I you know I was nervous and excited you know there are lots of opportunities for adoptees there's grants there's programs you know there's there's sort of programs specific to adoptees and I could have gone on like one of those sort of homeland trips but it, it never quite lines up with with schedule and theater made it hard to travel so I just was like you know I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do it on my own which is insane, but you know, that was how I was going to do it and get it done. And also like what would be, I think for me, I don't know, I guess I just knew in, in my heart that that was, I had to do it alone. I like couldn't go to, you know, that with like, you know, a, a friend or a cohort of adoptees. I just needed to be able to like process alone and, and deal with it on my own. Um, oh. Cause you know, like I, a lot of people go back uh in in their 20s at least now I just saw Kara's note ping up you know but like it um you know for me I was like this I, I traveled in Asia pretty extensively but not in East Asia so I had experience with Singapore and Malaysia and Indonesia but not Korea but I thought well I can handle it I'm a pretty hardy traveler <laughs> um so I digress I went back in 2015 to like vacation slash meet the adoption agency to go look at my paperwork i thought i knew what i was gonna find because i had already Ooh. seen the paperwork that the mm -hmm. agency sent to my parents there's a whole binder of stuff you know um what i found out upon going there is that there were more pieces of paper than my parents ever received and i got a whole new set of information about wow. my origin story wow that's huge so yeah so like at 36 finding out that oh no i wasn't left on the doorstep of a police station i was actually born in a hospital and here's a picture of the hospital and here's a picture of your foster mother you know and like and there Whoa. were descriptions of my birth parents um there are you know, just sort of a, an intake form, the, like all this stuff did not wow. exist really in, in my American file yeah. from the agents. So that's honestly, wow. that is the time now that my birth mother worked in a tailor shop. So I actually come from sewists. <laughs> wow. Now, you yeah. know, which is incredible, you know, and I was that's like, oh amazing. 
that's that's a moment that actually made it into hello my name is pretty verbatim that, oh, that awesome. experience yeah and so you know taking all of those things so i guess i was in korea for nine days and i just kept a journal and i wrote down everything because i had all this time alone yeah to process cry and drink a lot of coffee and go <laughs> shopping and see every museum in sight you know and just to like figure out what what it was about this country that I had lost that I didn't know yeah. at all and uh you know and and mucked around terribly with the language which was such a yeah ooh, that's such a thing you know that like I had watched a lot of YouTube and I had taken <laughs> some language lessons I was not I was not prepared for the sort of um the vocal paralysis that would happen to me that I would go mm, and I'd want to ask mm, for mm, mm. Go into a restaurant and I would know to be like menu juicy you know like and and I would get in there and I would look at them and I'd be like oh you know no and it's it real just, it all you know and um and I or I'd say like one sentence you know I'd just be like oh you know hello in Korean and they um you know, I'd be like, and yoga sale, and they would then rattle off whole sentences in Korean because I guess my like, accent was like, and this face looks good enough, you know, um, that they were like, oh, well, obviously, you know what you're doing. And then I like would not be able to reply because I didn't understand. <laughs> and then I would just give, yeah, I would give like the like nervous face, and they'd be like, oh, because uh, many of them speak English, but yeah. it's, you know the combination of looks of you know are you stupid you know like why don't you speak this language because even like some korean americans speak it but then i'd be like no you know adoptee um but that was always you know that that was an experience that like through yeah. journaling i was sort of capture the feeling of it so i could like retain what it was like to be betrayed by my own voice you know to be betrayed by lack of language yeah. Um, which actually, you know, like jumping forward, translated into the play, I sort of made it in like two acts. There's sort of like okay. the pre going to Korea and then post going to Korea. Sorry, tangents everywhere. Um, what we and do. so in the pre going to Korea for the three characters, because their lives sort of inevitably lead them there in for many, for different reasons. Um, and so pre-Korea, none of them really do much talking. Um, people talk around them, people talk for them, mm, uh, mm, but they mm. speak a lot of in silence. And if not in silence, then it's like voiceover of something that they're writing. Uh, but they often don't actually do a lot of sort of self-voicing. So there's a lot of dance sequences. There's a lot of like sort of silent movement sequences where we hear music and we see something happen. But it's because I wanted, I wanted the ad adoptees sort of purposely to be voiceless so that by the time we get to post-Korea, they have so much to say um, as they're trying to sort of get through, they grow up and they start to process. Um, and there's one character, June, you know, people would ask me afterwards, like, oh, which character is you? And I'm like, well, I mean, all of them are like, when I'd say June is the closest, um, there's June, Dana and Brian. And like, I would say June was sort of closest to my experience, mm -hmm. uh, my intellect. Dana was sort of my upbringing um, and my like, kind of I'm a grateful adoptee nothing is wrong with my life this isn't trauma you know kind of character side yep. and then Brian was my anger you know Brian was like pure <laughs> pure on un unadulterated sociopathic anger um and he is actually directly based on a guy that I met uh when I was there who oh was wow supported. oh wow yeah and well, then you know all I, of those things are valid right oh. <laughs> Parts of the experience. And part of the experience, part of that, you know, part of that huge network of people. Because I think I interviewed a lot of people and I surveyed a lot of people um, mm -hmm. as I was just starting to do research. I joined a lot of groups. Whew, I joined a lot of groups on Facebook. Some <laughs> are specific for Korean adoptees, some are specific to adoptees. Um, 
and some are specific to like transracial adoptees, but there's also groups that have parents in them or oh. other people in the adoption triangle of birth parent, adoptive parent, adoptee. And so those are very interesting spaces and actually spaces where I think I learned the most about oh. why so many adoptees are angry and and why uh you know people are are calling it trauma and processing trauma which i truly believe that the adoption process is by nature traumatic because you're doing this sort of parental transfer whether from one parent to a foster to another you know um often or it's like one parent to another but yeah there's this handoff and then you add this sort of layer of race into it for transracial adoptees. And it gets even weirder because so many, you know, so many transracial adoptees, they're, they're adopted by white parents. Um, and so navigating that, like I was adopted, I was born and adopted in 1978. So mm -hmm. this is sort of before the wave of adoptees from China mm -hmm. um, that you'll meet Chinese adoptees who were sort of born in the nine uh, or adopted in the nineties and born in the eighties. Mm -hmm. So it's uh yeah there have been different waves from different countries you know mm -hmm. people, people yeah yeah in it. um so getting to navigate those spaces and just seeing like adoptees push back and then parents pushing back and parents learning and well-meaning people and allies and you know it just really showed me the true colors of what happens in these spaces which is sort of beautiful when you're writing drama <laughs> you know, oh, yeah it's like oh I'm so really. such a rich source of material exactly and so through that i connected and interviewed a lot of different people um through all manner you know there were people that are like i had a great upbringing my parents are awesome we're very close and i'm like that's amazing like it's and that is the experience of a lot of people truly you know and mm -hmm. then might ask them 10 years later and they're like well this change is a little different you know and then some are like nope it's still good and then you've got others that are like nope i left home at 18 and i was done you know and then you've got others that are like, oh, you know, I am in reunion. I found my birth parents and I have relationships with both families. And so it's, mm. it was a gamut of experience. Yeah. And I just wanted to be able to, this sort of like sweet spot in, in between a lot of them. Obviously I can't capture everything, but into no. these three characters, it's like a palimpsest of stories that exist yeah. inside each of them. That's wonderful. And it's, it sounds like you really did create a dance. In a lot of I ways. Tried. <laughs> I mean, it was really a very careful balancing of like not making the characters too sort of one one sided. I mean, it was sort of impossible to do with the plethora of stories going into it. But also, I didn't want to like flatten anybody down. Um, yeah. But yeah, huge to to the actors who just really like embrace those roles it was one of those moments where i also sort of served as like kind of partial dramaturg you know in in being the writer but also wanting to feel a bit impartial sort of like putting together these these sort of maps for them and i'm like if you want to hear the story of where i got this from i'm happy to tell you but i don't need to to sort of respect that you know I, I, my work had to end at some point and theirs had to begin um yeah. But I also, you know, it was the work that went to Prague um, was the design work, which I made mm. from, you know, which I was the sort of primary scenic designer and concept designer. But I had an incredible team of people uh, that were working with me to to so bring cool. to bring it to yeah. provide the thousand props and paint rooms in this house and like. You so know, you built an place. interactive house, essentially. I did. That's yeah. amazing. So there's this, yeah, there's an, uh, an incredible art space here in Tacoma um, called Rhizome. And um, they are just an incredible organization. Right, I think it's rhizome, rhizomedc.org. And um, they are a, let's see, how many rooms are in that house? One, two, three, four, five rooms plus a porch uh plus a a whole backyard and Neat. so we essentially have this like crazy stairwell you know but it's not very big so we could only have 15 people in the audience at a okay. time 
and packed we packed them in like sardines in every single room um and they did they sort of had to like stand up against the walls you know we had these like tiny little stools for them to park themselves on because if they moved around too much you know people wouldn't be able to see um and yeah we moved them from room to room as the show progressed sometimes flipping the room like we had a living room space that oh. was oh my gosh the living room was everything from an airport terminal to the adoption agency to uh when we had rain the wedding venue to um oh my gosh the 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 house that you first enter in and we just kind of kept flipping it around like anytime someone left we would just pull curtains and change props i mean it wasn't a full turnover but it definitely felt different from space to space to space we even turned it over when they were blindfolded there was this airplane sequence um wow that we had everybody down and the actors bless them dressed as stewardesses you know did this whole pre-show airplane speech and handed out um uh you know the the airline blindfolds and gave everybody um there were little tiny headsets that we ran off of what did we do fm radio or am radio on like a very you know specific frequency uh, mm -hmm. frequency they were all tuned into this radio station essentially that was playing our sound cue <laughs> and that's great they're there with their masks on and they're all occupied listening to the scene of feeling like they're on an airplane and um while that's happening we are literally changing the set around now. <laughs> so they they pay no attention and <laughs> sequence ends they take off their blindfolds you know people come through and collect them and we're in the adoption agency because That's like great. we didn't need to travel them we didn't need yeah. to like walk them back out we could just keep them sitting in the same place and say all right now you're going to watch this scene and then another actor would appear into it so we found ways to sort of push the narrative um even if we weren't physically pushing people which that sounds was, like, like really cool yeah I mean, it sounds like that's some of your favorite theater, that kind of theater. It really you, do you have some other ones that were like real highlights? I don't know. Highlight um, reel. <laughs> oh my gosh. It could be more recent really ones. Recent. I know this is an older one, right? I know it is an older one now, which is like, oh my gosh, you know, what am I going to do next? I, I have all sorts of folders on my computer that are like unfinished i don't know what's it's hard to call them plays because like mm -hmm. i'm definitely i'll tell you about one that i'm writing now that i pull out every six months and go oh well, there's more here than i remember you know mm -hmm. but i am writing um i'll call it a treatment about three three fishermen um that are uh presumably from north korea um, and it takes place on the western shores of Japan, and it's based on hmm. this New York Times article um, where these sort of fishing boats are washing up uh, on the west coast of Japan, they presume from North Korea because the currents, um, mm -hmm. and they're empty, or there will be like bones, or, you know, some remnant of human or something, uh, but I don't really know anything. So I was like, I got to know more about this. And they call them ghost ships. Yeah. Because um, they're sort of washing up full of artifacts, but but devoid of people. And uh, whoa. So well, there's a ghost story. story. <laughs> so I'm writing the story of these three fishermen and sort of why they made the escape from North Korea, um, hmm. except that there was no actors. So the whole concept is that people audience members go onto a boat and there are artifacts that are left over from the fishermen that lived on the boat but there are no fishermen so you have to like recreate their lives and sort of the situation that went down uh without their presence but with their leavings That's so great. it's a <laughs> but um yeah i'm hoping that you know, it's one of those things that I'm like, okay, someday I'm going to like workshop this thing for a while. I mean, in my, in my slightly obsessive, oh, I have to have the reality. I need a boat. And I was like, <laughs> don't, don't. <laughs> you know? That's maybe, maybe a doubt. Because that, that's, yeah. that's a lot of logistics. But I was like, all right, what can I do in a space? Can I build the skeleton of a boat and just place 
objects, you know, kind of escape room style. Yeah. Um, so I'm sort of thinking through like, how can I workshop this idea without having all of the trappings of the thing? Cause I, I mm -hmm. again, could utilize sound to push people around or not. Uh, you know, I could use mm -hmm. external cues, you know, so I'm just trying to think about all of the things that make, mm. it's like every tool that makes for immersion, how can I use it to push a narrative in the absence of an actor telling you what you need to look at? Um, so it's just, it's something that I'm like constantly sort of working through in my mind to be like, all right, what, what makes us do a thing? Oh, a light. A light makes yes. us look, you know, you're, you're at a bar and there's a bright TV, you will look at the TV mm -hmm. um, and not in front of you, you know, or you hear a sound, you will go, what is that? And you will look in that direction. And so directional cues, things that we as humans are, are, are sort of driven to are, are the things that sort of really interest me of like what literally moves a person, you know, what takes Neat. somebody focus from here to there. And I'm going to use all of those things again and again to, to do that, you know, or like what makes something real, the fact that you can pick up a journal and read like somebody's log book, all those log numbers want to be real. They don't want to be arbitrary, you know? So like, I have some maritime navigation work to do, you know, I've got like, um, so I don't know, it, like those, these kinds of projects really feed my, uh, my sort of research brain and, and the, the, fantasy you know creation of of a whole world yeah um, you know i mean in this file it's like the file is it's the story of what happened is one thing that i wrote and then i wrote three really like long character bios so it's almost kind of like writing a, like a novella um and then mm -hmm. i have like an excel spreadsheet of you know for, right now i think i'm up to like 80 80 or 90 props um, and then deciding, you know, the ones that are highlighted, this is activated, this has a light, this makes a sound, this goes here, this has to be replenished, um, this gets torn up every show, I need six of these, you know, and so like, I'm I'm thinking through the logistics of like yeah. how it works as well, what each piece does narratively, and then yeah. what pieces are just dressed but also what is not so enticing as dressing that someone will go down a rabbit hole and be like, I read every page of this log book and I got no information. Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, you yeah. know, um, so yeah, it's, it's been an interesting thing of sort of bandying that back and forth. That's um, really fabulous. I don't know. I, I will produce this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know we were talking right before you started about what happens because when you do a design, a lot of times you're telling somebody else's story. Um, mm -hmm. But this one, you're choosing what parts of the story to tell in a very direct way. It's very yours, much yours, in the same way that the uh, the jewelry pieces that you've been making for the art markets lately are very much yours. And it's so yeah. important to have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, I describe working on my own pieces and empowering i think that it's interesting one thing that people have asked me about my work over the years they're like oh i mean do you consider yourself like an auteur and i was like no <laughs> it's it's not the i think of myself as like a curator in in a lot of ways in inside of my own work and even inside other people that I'm bringing together elements that maybe haven't been brought together in quite that way. Um, and I'm, I'm reassembling them, you know, I'm yeah. taking the research, the history, the work, the ideas of others, transforming them through my own lens and then fusing them together. And that's how I think about the creation of the work that like, I think I used to think, Oh, I want to create something truly original. And then, you know, five or six years into my career, I was like, wow, nothing is actually really original. You know, it's how I'm putting it together. That is yeah. no idea. Every idea has been thought. I just want to put together a new combination of ideas to to make the thing that feels like it's mine. Um yeah. and I don't get that with every piece. I have definitely designed pieces that I'm like, well, it doesn't feel like me. But that's okay you know in the end like you can't win every game it, you do some things for the paycheck uh you do some things because you have great yeah. collaborators even on those projects sometimes they don't feel like mine um yeah but but that's okay 
you know, like I'm actually, I'm very at peace uh, with that because I, I have enough things that feel like they're under my control. I make jewelry and art and prints and, and other things because no one is giving me notes, which is kind of awesome. Um, <laughs> I love that. Live a, live a life full of, of getting notes from other people. Well, you know, I don't know if I really like that thing. And I'm like, oh my God, okay. I don't you want know, to resell so, that snaps on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, can you make it faster? And you're like, okay. You know, even <laughs> though you know, like, everything is rigged together with zippers and magnets and God knows what else, you know, but mm -hmm. like, it's. We can try. It still wants to. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, in, in, my, in my embroidery life, not only does the embroidery not talk back, it, it is, you know, if, if I don't ah. like it, I can cut it, do it again, you know, so. <laughs> yes, there's always that. I mean, I love actors. I actually really, really love working with actors. It's one of the favorite things about being a costume designer. But, you know, it, it is sometimes after long, long hours of working and collaborating with people, despite loving it I am tired and I just want to like not talk to anybody listen to podcasts and so <laughs> and make something yeah. for me yeah fair of course and you were going to be I was before we get into questions I just wanted to say you are just now going to be starting a whole new phase of your career yes yeah Yay. congratulations uh, you know, thank you you know I will continue teaching uh I guess I will have many more students uh, mm -hmm. than I currently have. Um, and I mean, I think it'll be like Ithaca is a really beautiful artistic community and I'm really looking forward to sort of being back in nature. Um, yeah. It's not that DC doesn't have nature. DC's got a ton of trees, but but you have to like go to them. And I, I grew up in rural Connecticut. So like I grew up amongst the trees and now I feel like this is sort of my, my return. <laughs> my return to the trees and the streams and all the mm -hmm. waterfalls. I mean, when people say Ithaca is gorgeous, yes, it's 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 the pun of like there's gorgeous, but it truly mm -hmm. is like a gorgeous, which is like a lot of good energy. So I I feel good about yeah entering into into a school and a land that just feels really right. Yay! Congratulations. That's so cool. So did anybody have some questions for Deb? You can put them in the chat if you would like or you can ask them out loud if you want to unmute yourself. If not, I will ask questions. That's perfectly fine. I have a question. Hi, um, come on. What is something that you've not yet done that you still want to do or wish would come to fruition? Ooh, it's such a good question because I feel like my life has been this sort of it's been a little tumultuous lately of like big life changes, et cetera. So I'm just like, okay, I'm, I'm in this place where I'm like manifesting really hard for like something new and interesting to sort of come next, which I think will probably be determined, you know, once sort of arriving in Ithaca and settling into that job and that kind of thing. But, you know, cause I, I think a, a traditional designer answer would be like, oh, I would like to design on Broadway, mm, you know, <laughs> barely designed in New York. But uh, I think one thing I would like to tackle um, is some sort of like large scale, ugh, this sounds insane, but I'm, I'm putting it out there. I would like to tackle like a, like a large scale multi-day event that is also like an immersive and i know that this exists in like the larp world you know that, that this is a world that already sort of exists but i think that there there is something that i'm really intrigued by in creating really small boutique experiences actually Ooh. that require um you know like a, a a sort of deep research on a group of people and doing something that might be adjacent to like you know, a, uh, something that they want to tackle or problem solve, um, whether in their own lives or or sort of in a, in a secondary kind of life, um, you know, how they work through something. So for instance, and I'm not sure I would, you know, this is just coming off the top of my head, but like say um, a, a grieving family trying to work through what to do with their inheritance you know uh or something wow. like figuring 
you know, how to solve a, a longstanding family feud, you know, might enter into this world or become a witness to this world in which that gets played out for them, you know, in, in some way, shape or form in long form where there's like everything from meals together and places that people stay, but they sort of end up living almost like, I don't know, an, an, an alternate experience. Like it might take place between like five houses, you know, and each family unit group and then a group of of what I call agents which are sort of like actors with a with a sort of stage managerial presence you know go yeah. in and arrange for them like they don't become other family members they sort of become like I don't know you know maybe the the domestics of the house then say oh no 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 we're going to take care of all of this mm. let us help you and then are able to like walk them through or show them something or reveal um you know a could be scenario or something you know obviously I haven't put a lot of thought into it but I I know that I want to just see how far we can push like what is theater oh yeah um into yeah into a physical world like I think that a lot of people are doing this in the digital space in the VR space the AR yeah. space I want to see what we can do if we actually prop it, live it, paint it, you know, dress it for, for real so that people can actually touch it. Yeah. Um, different happens when the experience is tactile and not just something that you're watching. Cause you'd be like, Oh, well, you know, you can separate it. If, if you're watching it on a screen, you can be like, I can close my eyes and this will go away. Yeah. But if, if you're eating a meal, and I'm handing you things and you're sitting on sandpaper, you know, like you're going to feel all those things yeah. um, in a different embodied physical way. And I, I don't know. I just, I want to see what, what that world is. Cause that that's like the world I want to experience. I kind of want to just be like rocked down to my socks <laughs> by that. So that's, that's what I want to be creating. That sounds amazing. Cause yeah, I mean, you can have the, uh, Monica was saying that you're going to Netropolis with your son, which Neotropolis. is awesome. So Neotropolis. It's, it's by the people who do uh, Wasteland Weekend. Which gotcha. Helps. But this yeah. is the, the cyberpunk version of that, yeah, right? Yeah, so it's a cyberpunk version. But he does a LARP that's um, called Dystopia Rising, where it's another dystopian, obviously, uh, world. And then they're fighting off zombies. And I think mm. it's so interesting. It's almost like play acting fighting off your demons you know, mm. how to problem solve how to deal with it and how to keep yourself safe and how to protect others and how to how to sometimes battle and it, it's just metaphorically I find it fascinating that is but I also I love it, yeah that's great go ahead I'm sorry yeah I, I think it can be really empowering for the people that are doing it um yeah, I I want to, I mean, I think the first thing I need to do is probably, you know, start experiencing some some long form LARPs. It's not something that, I, something that I've done. I've done some short form, but, uh, you know, like a few hours, but I haven't done like a whole weekend. But I know I have friends who do it and it's like costume and character and so much study. And I think what I'd like to do is sort of pull back on, on the, you're doing the studying and have that sort of arrive around people so that there there's mm. the, the work is not necessarily for the participants that their, their job is literally just to like experience and participate. It's, it's a, a less high, high impact um, mm. for, for them their sort of workload you know i just want to find that balance because like it's funny i love creating immersive theater for other people i don't love experiencing immersive theater myself i think for oh. me i get nervous um that i'm like not going to do it right and that is sort of one of the first yeah. rules of creating immersive theater is that like everybody wants to be right everybody wants to do the right thing and so if they are unsure about what choice is the right choice to make, they won't make any choice. And mm. so you have to push, people, you have to compel people, and then you have to reward people when they get it right and, and like help them get it there, but also make it think that it was their idea. It's extremely manipulative, I know, <laughs> but that's what we do. 
it's a theater yeah. artist. Yeah. But I, I think so much design is like that too. I mean, you want to talk manipulative design, go to Las Vegas. That's entirely, oh yeah. entirely manipulative from the carpeting to the lighting, to the smells, every last bit of it, yeah. you know, yeah. Disney, Disney. highly yeah. controlled environments. I mean, it's genius. It's really amazing. And like, yeah, I just learned, thing. I just learned recently about how at Disney, all the smells that they put through, mm -hmm. like, you're not actually smelling the popcorn, but they're putting in the scent into the air of popcorn and you know, various things like that. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, whole department of, a department of smells that they have. I don't know what it's really called, but it's like, wow, they thought of everything. <laughs> it's the olfactory visions. Yes. Yeah, no yeah. The smell of vision is a thing. I I remember having worked on um, Disney on Ice, and they were doing this the um, display area and you know snack bars and whatever on the outside of them where they're doing the previews, and the aggressive scent of piped in cotton candy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just like whoa, hits you like a wave. Wow. <laughs> but that, I love the idea of doing meals. That would be such a neat thing for an immersive theater experience. Yeah. We fed people in hello to minimally, you know, but yeah. at the beginning arrived and we had been cooking. We, we took about what the 25 minutes before audience was coming in to start cooking hot dish. So you came into the smell of like tater tots and cheese. <laughs> um, and like, brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, so you're, you know, like the minute people are on the porch, they are greeted by a woman with a deep Minnesota accent, you know, being like, hello, come on in, you know, and you're at the, you're like immediately swept into this sort of arrival party for the first adoptee and you're offered hot dish. Some audiences were like, oh my gosh, we don't know what to do, <laughs> you know, and, they, and then other audiences would just like eat everything in sight. Um, cause yeah, I, it's like an awkward minute and it's supposed to be awkward. Um, so we might as well give them something to eat, but yeah, <laughs> that, that small part of it in a small house. And then when we got to Korea, we fed everybody a little like sort of seaweed, rice and kimchi roll and a shot of soju. So, um, you know, it was really, it was fun to, to incorporate food into that, even though like I, I was often the, the sort of principal cook because <laughs> we had this like tiny kitchen and a very small crew that did amazing work. But uh, yeah, I and the welders would take turns, you know, sort of running that show from the back end. That's a lot of hot dish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Thanks. <laughs> but a lot of frozen tater tots. I imagine, I can only imagine, but that's, a, what a brilliant way to do it. But yeah, I love that idea for building whatever your next idea is and having it be multiple layers um, mm -hmm. and multiple days. What a neat yeah. thing. Sort of a choose your own adventure into your own life kind of thing. I, something like that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. All right, well, here's here's to that coming true over in Ithaca. Yeah. I think that could work really well. Right? I just need, I just need a farm. <laughs> um, well, I think you can probably find somebody who has one nearby. I'm guessing. Here's open. All right. I'm, I'm all right. Let's, let's put that out there into the universe. Deb needs right. a farm, a farm near Ithaca. It'll be perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and Kara and Winter, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? No? Oh, no. I do. I couldn't find the unmute button. Deb, <laughs> did you Hi. by chance live and breathe and work at only for one of the only theater apprenticeships? I did, yes. <laughs> Yay, I just applied for for this year. Oh, excellent. Oh, yay. Awesome. yay. And yeah, I, I love it more offline about it, but yeah. yeah. That'll be really, really cool. Congratulations. Thank you. I, I yeah. hope that that all works out. And, uh, and as a mom question, mm -hmm. um, winter's been counseled in two different directions. 
and wondered, Deb, from your experience, what you think would be the best track to take. Um, someone was saying that he should go right into the local wardrobe costume union and just start working in the back of houses mm -hmm. versus trying to learn more about the craft. And he's not, I don't think he wants to be a designer anymore since he had that experience in college. He realizes he wants to. I like making the things. He likes doing the mm -hmm. hands-on and assisting. He doesn't want to be mm -hmm. the designer. I like getting punched in the face during quick changes. He's a quick change lover. Um, I, I tell you, I get it. But he's following his one designer around assisting and helping like he's working at Imagination Stage now. And I don't know, I feel mm -hmm. like even though it's not constant work and that's where the, it, you know, it's like versus the money versus the education and experience. Mm -hmm. So just wondered what you thought. Yeah, I mean, I think you can do a little of, of everything, you know, there are certain times a year that are, um, you know, busier than others, like uh, Laura and I met many, many years ago at Colorado Shakes, uh, yeah. where I went summers that I was a graduate student, because like summers tend to be, you know, the sort of low season for any kind of regional theater work um, and sort of standard year round stuff. Uh, and, and a lot of people just sort of take uh, take their summer contracts um, as sort of a separate thing. You know, it's a time to to travel and honestly be in one place for 12 weeks is like actually really nice after freelancing and hopping around like all year long. Um, and also a concentrated time where like, if winter you wanted to do wardrobe, you know, you could do 12 weeks of wardrobe at like a Shakespeare festival or, or an opera company like Glimmerglass. Um, and then it's over in 12 weeks and then resume doing assistantship work and shop, you know, shop work during the year or the flip, you know, mm -hmm. wardrobe IATSE during the year where actually there's a lot of work um, or, you know, and then do, you know, stitching work in, in the summers to sort of keep your skills up. Mm -hmm. Like years later, I actually still will occasionally take like a stitching job or, or a dye paint job. Um, just to keep my skills up because I've gotten to the point in my design career where I'm actually not really making much anymore. So that's again, why I sort of took on uh, a market life to keep using my hands. Cause like, that's part of it that I love. It's my first love. And I fear that if I stop doing it, I will just like forget, I will lose those hand skills and I'll lose the ability to communicate as a, as a maker with all the brilliant makers that I work with, who are frankly all better at draping than I am. So that is like totally fine. I'm happy to hand that off. Um, and also like, I love being able to, to speak both languages um, of, of sort of backstage and design the, the making and the art. That is hugely helpful. Yeah, and if yeah. you really like that, um, there are several of the summer stock programs where you can go and make during a portion of during the building portion of the season, and then go in and do the wardrobe. So both yeah. things can happen, and figure out what portions of it you like best. You know, that is so helpful. Yeah, um, yeah. I know Colorado Shakes had that. I know there are plenty of summer stock places that have that option. So. I'm Cool. Well, we're going to follow you. We're not going to come to Ithaca this week, but we're going to go see your show at George Mason, and then we'll see what we can do up in Ithaca. I'm making awesome. this for work. What is this? Ooh. It is a patchwork vest thing there... that stabbed there... me a million times. Oh, no. Very. I'm going to add that pin so I can see it a little better. Oh, yeah. Uh... You know, if it, you haven't been stabbed, you're not working on things. <laughs> it's what I have found. Oh, Laura knows this firsthand. That's it. That's just real talk. This is how we go. I agree. Yes. That's I awesome. Agree. That is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's really cool. And thank you, Deb, for doing this. This is really cool. I'm so glad that you could join us and tell us all your stories. Well, we're kind of groupies yeah. of Deb mm -hmm. and, uh, just I'm so as a as an adoptive mom, like I see Deb and I'm so incredibly proud to follow your career and what you've done. And it's like 
Yay. And the fact that you have incorporated your Korean story, uh, I just can't even explain to you how meaningful that is to me and then hopefully to my son. And mm -hmm. that really means so much. And especially this small yeah. community. Yeah. Yeah. And Winter, I see you. And I'm going to read that play and respond when I get a chance. <laughs> Whenever you have time. All yes. right. All good. Well, Monica or Aiden, did you have any things you'd like to, to poke in on? No? Not specifically, but I, I really enjoyed hearing all the stories. Thank you, Deb. Thank you so much. That is awesome. All right. Then we shall be done. And um, thanks again.